You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options Welcome to Coffee with Cot, where advisors can find out what is brewing in the options space with your host, OIC's Director of Education, Eric Cott. OCC was created in 1973, and OIC is an industry resource supported by OCC to provide trustworthy education about the benefits and risks of exchange-listed options. Since 1992, OIC has been dedicated to increasing the awareness, knowledge, and responsible use of options by individual investors financial advisors, and institutional managers. Before we get started with this show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should never enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the act accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margin interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as recommendation to buy or sell a security or to provide investment advice. Welcome, everyone. I am your barista for this program. So glad you could join us. Please go ahead and fill up your cups with a hot beverage of your choice. Whether you're cold brew, double espresso, mocha cappuccino grande type, we have you covered. On this show, we pour over topics that relate to your practice, your clients, and options. All right, everybody, new music can mean only one thing. It is time for a new program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network. I'm always excited. It's my pretty much one of my favorite times of the year when we get to introduce new programming here on the old network. My name is Mark Longo, of course, from the aforementioned Options Insider Radio Network, as well as, of course, from the optionsinsider.com. And I'm pleased to introduce the latest edition to the Options Insider Radio Network, Coffee with Cot. You can tell by the title, it's not going to be with me. No, it's going to be with our old friend of the network. He's been on many times, but this is his first time getting upgraded to a full-blown hosting chair. I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Eric Cott, the Director of Advisor Education and Business Development over there at the Options Industry Council. Eric, welcome to your own program, sir. Mark, this is exciting for all the years that you and I have talked and shared insight in the advisor community and how options play such a big part. Now, the baton in some ways has been handed over, and I'm very excited to launch uh, in 2019 our first show. It is a big moment. We have been talking about this in some form for some time. So I'm glad to see that it is finally coming to fruition. Let's start there. Obviously, you've been on many times in the past on our advisor's option program, on our interview program, at our various roundtables and interview sessions we do at OIC over the years. But we always have new entrants to the network, and I'm sure new people will be coming to this show who maybe haven't heard your previous appearances. So let's start there. Eric, who are you, and what the heck does the Director of Advisor Education and Business Development at OIC do all day? Well, one thing I do know, Mark, is that I'm a lot older than Tom Brady, and I don't have six rings. However, <laughs> I will tell you that— But still quite as dashingly good-looking, sir. That is very kind of you. One thing that I will say is, is that's exciting for OIC, which is celebrating 26 years. That's the Option Industry Council, where the outreach for education to, as you know, Mark, and your listeners, to individuals, institutions, and, of course, near and dear to my heart, the advisor community— February 2019 will now mark a decade of the development and outreach of advisor education. So along the way, 
with a lot of help from you and your program and your listeners, it really made sense to offer something that we could do in a more digital format. You know, we've most certainly been boots to the ground, out there talking to advisors, sharing our research, sharing our marketing. But what we were looking to do was create something that was a little more percolating, <laughs> some some insight on not only option strategies and how advisors can better manage their practice and their clients, but also to provide some other topics that were related to option strategies, but also to get advisors thinking a little bit more of how ways they can help their clients. That's a good use of a pun, sir. They're percolating. But let's get into that as well. The title, you know, are we going to be discussing maybe Venezuelan versus Colombian blends on this show? Where does the title Coffee with Cot come from, sir? Well, I have to give credit where credit's due to one of the exchanges that I represent. And, you know, very intimately, the NASDAQ exchange, uh, the OIC hosts a conference every year. We've been doing it for multiple decades. And back in 2018, was very fortunate enough, all the senior executives there at NASDAQ had coined this wonderful title where I had advisors on stage with me, Coffee with Cot. And thanks to the wonderful support that I get, I feel really like a quarterback of a team. But again, you really need teammates to make this happen. And everybody in Chicago at the Option Industry Council, we all came together. And uh, you know, the goal in mine was to provide, as I said before, sort of insight for advisors, but we were fortunate enough that this title kind of generated a lot of buzz, again, using the uh, pun there, uh, with some caffeine uh, into the whole topic. But it really was an opportunity to, you know, kind of drive into what were, I guess, topics, Mark, that advisors were speaking to us on the road about. And we said, you know, why don't we bring some of these speakers on board, you know, and kind of delve in a little bit deeper and provide something that advisors can do on their own time. Because as you know, Mark, that's really the most important here, you know, when an advisor can kind of listen to these, you know, on their own schedule. It's disappointing. I was looking forward to a breakdown of the latest blends coming out of Nicaragua. <laughs> I hear they have good stuff these days. And you know, I was looking to you to be my go-to resource. I guess, I guess I'll have to find that info elsewhere, sir. But let's talk about the info a little bit. You kind of hinted at it a little bit. You want to take a little bit more digital, digital easily downloadable, easily digestible format here for the show. So what are some of the topics you're going to dive into? What are some of the guests you're planning on featuring? What can people expect from this show in the coming months, sir? Well, I don't want to steal any of the thunder since we're going to be launching this month, but you know, we're obviously seeing a lot of discussion about volatility in the markets. So that sort of is a theme that uh, we're going to talk about this month. And then where we've also seen interest on the part of the advisor community as it ties in with options, ETFs are a very, very hot topic. Mark, you and I had the good fortune of being together in uh, my home state of Florida last year when we talked about the Inside ETF conference and all that was going on. We've seen precipitous growth, obviously, from the OCC, clearing a lot more in terms of options on ETFs. Uh, fintech is another topic, Mark, that has really caught a lot of the attention of advisors. I know you've had a number of these individuals on past programs, so we're hoping to bring in some maybe surprise guests that are in this new genre of offering technology to advisors, not only to track strategies, but ways to really make the implementation of options, I don't want to say easier, Mark, but maybe you know, you know, forming a, a little more unified in their practice. So, and then you know, obviously, we've got a number of advisors that sit on a council that we've had for quite some time right now. Some of them have been on your show before, so we're looking to leverage, no pun intended, some of the advisors that sit on our, our advisor leadership council to be able to what we feel is advisors talking to advisors you know so the individuals who are living and breathing this every day and able to probably share some of their wisdom and insight to other advisors 
who might be a little bit reticent. I mean, you see this a lot, Mark. I hear of it all the time that, you know, advisors tend to be a little bit skittish and I don't want to say embarrassed, but they might be hesitant to say they're not really knowledgeable about how to convey a certain strategy to a client. And so they end up not talking about it at all. Yeah, you know, that, that's certainly been our MO for a long time now on our advisor's option program and many of the programs we produce on our network that are aimed at the advisor or professional institutional audience. You're right. He's a little bit reticent to maybe turn to the guy next to him on his desk and say he doesn't know what a covered call is or certainly to admit that to his clients. But on his own schedule, on his own time, he's free to download and listen in the privacy of his own his iPhone there. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this outreach goes. And speaking of outreach and, and kind of the frequency and the schedule, what can people expect from the coffee of the cot? Obviously, you and the team are traveling a lot, so it's not going to be a, a weekly or even like a monthly type show. What kind of frequency are we looking at here for coffee with cot, Eric? You know, I'm glad you asked, Mark, because what we decided to do for this year, because this is really our inaugural launch of this, we're not only going to be doing podcasts, but we're encouraging our advisor community to look out for, we're going to have monthly blogs, fortunate enough that we're starting off already in January, and then we're going to consecutively go throughout the rest of the year uh, producing a blog that will be distributed to the advisor community. What advisors can look for is six podcasts for this year. Uh, we actually had a little bit um, of a backlog in terms of getting ourselves to this point. And as you know, Mark, technology could be your friend or foe. <laughs> so we really kind of had to make sure that everything was in place before we decided to do this. Um, we also plan to have some more webinars sprinkled in, I guess, along with our pod podcast. So uh, we look at this as sort of a three-pronged digital approach, Mark, with monthly blogs, uh, about six podcasts for the year, and then probably having a couple of webinars there, uh, maybe in the slower months of the summer, where uh, we want to be able to bring a topic about taxes or something. And by the way, you were going back for a second, asking me about uh, one of the topics that advisors might look for maybe later in the year. I know you've talked about this, Mark, before in your program, and that tends to be something that comes up quite often is sort of the tax implications or some of the issues that come around taxes with advisors who frequently use options with their clients. So I would you know, let our listeners know that that is a topic that will most certainly be, um, you know, on the docket. We're not, we're not quite sure when we're going to be uh, launching that podcast under the Coffee with Cot, you know, show, but uh, that is something that they should uh, look out for. Tax consequences certainly front and center with this audience, not just end of the year, but pretty much all year round. They love that, sure. that tax-oriented content, so you can't do enough of that. So at least six podcast episodes, then we're talking obviously the monthly blogs, and where can they find all the blog, all that goodness? Is that optionseducation.org in the advisor channel? Is it going to be a separate home for Coffee with Cot? Where are we going for all this stuff? Well, it, the optionseducation.org is the central place that we encourage everybody to go to. There is absolutely a distinct advisor landing page there. I also encourage our listeners, and they're well aware of this because you're kind of promoting this all the time, which we appreciate the OCC and the OIC appreciate you doing this, the 888 options. I really think that I have that number tattooed somewhere on me because it's hard not to forget it. But I just want to reiterate that 888 options number because that's the amazing team that's in Chicago at Investor Services. They can also you know, utilize that service, any of our advisors that, uh, that want to call into there. But, um, you know, our uh, spectacular team there uh, in Texas and Chicago will have more information um, as we're sort of launching the podcast and distributing it out there. Uh, we'll, you know, you'll also be seeing on the Web page, which uh, we had done years ago, Mark, and we decided we're going to reintroduce that. I wouldn't say it's kind of a where is Waldo, but we're going to have where is the coffee with Cot. Uh, sort of different places around the country because, as you know, my second home is on an airplane or in a hotel room. So I tend to be traveling quite often. You know, work is never done. And I, I feel very fortunate, you know, to be a participant, uh, whether it's a speaker, an exhibitor, or, uh, or joining on panels at, you know, advisor events and, you know, other industry uh, conferences. 
So that's another area where you know our advisor community can find some of this information. In fact, you're joining us from on the road right now. You're a road warrior 24-7, sir. So I'm glad you could find time for your own show, which is, which is very <laughs> generous of you. But just to summarize then for our audience, and we're looking at you know probably every two months for the episodes of Coffee with Cot, the blogs in between. You can find those over there at optionseducation.org. And hopefully we'll get a chance to augment those six episodes with some other recordings, whether they're webinars. Maybe we'll sneak Eric into a conference with the recorder. What do you think, Eric? He'll be our man on the scene for all these different conferences. We can try to augment that audio with some of these events you attend all the time. Maybe you'll sit down with people at the events. That's exciting. You know, Mark, it, we've talked about that with you, and we've talked about it in Chicago. And I feel that once we sort of get the, the ball rolling, and I know we're going to have a lot of success because the advisor community has been really gracious in, in embracing what we've done and – I think that having some opportunity to broadcast from some of these events is just another exciting way to deliver the content. So I agree with you, Mark. And then one of the things I would encourage our listeners to do, which we're going to keep reiterating, uh, you know, to anybody that's listening is, is that we're always open to suggestions, you know, on topics and things that they'd like to hear about. You know, that's where I tend to get, you know, some of my best information is when I'm sitting in an advisor's office or I have the opportunity, you know, to be at a conference and I'm around a group of advisors and discussions come up about client situations, you know, that's really where, you know, the timely stuff is presented back to us. So, you know, I would encourage uh, our listeners, you know, to give us the feedback. That's, that's really what we want to hear. Well, exciting stuff. I won't get in your way anymore, sir. I want to hand off the hosting baton to you so you can go forth and prosper with your own podcast, sir. I think you have some great guests in store for us. So I'm looking forward to that. And I wish you great success and hopefully many, many episodes of Coffee with Cot and maybe some delicious blend reviews as well to come, sir. Well, I appreciate it, Mark. We wouldn't be able to do this without your support. And we're very excited uh, for 2019. Hello, bonjour, ciao, guten tag, ni hao, shalom. <laughs> Welcome to Coffee with Cot. I am Eric Cot, Director of Education and Business Development at the OIC, the Option Industry Council, and I will be your senior barista and host for this new podcast series. Celebrating a decade this month with the establishment of the Financial Advisor Program back in 2009. So it seemed appropriate to launch this new podcast to option-centric advisors and for those that might be thinking about adding options to their practice. We intend to provide percolating insight on option strategies and practice management ideas, really designed to offer the advisor community a new flavor on how to look at their practices. So for those who are new to options, the Option Industry Council, OIC, was created 26 years ago in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. We offer a variety of resources to those interested in learning more about options, including live seminars, webcasts, and of course, podcasts like this. There are certain ways you could stay connected, such as... You can like the OIC page on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter at OIC underscore advisor. And of course, join our LinkedIn group at OIC advisor. I have to tell you, it's an exciting day to kick off this inaugural CWC podcast on a timely topic, volatility. This comes right after Super Bowl 52, which I have to say is sort of serendipitous as I entered this great earth the same time as this big sort of first NFL game started. And I kind of have to say that it was an unpredictable and maybe snoozer of a game. I wouldn't say that's the case with the markets. And boy, we've really seen, obviously, a lot of gyrations in the market lately. Now, as you can tell, I am very energized and definitely over-caffeinated about my two guests today because they're not only mentors and friends, but really tremendous colleagues to the OIC. And of course, by the way, these, these gentlemen really know a heck of a lot about the topic of volatility and options, as probably you all know, and I, they might even be sharing some post-NFL game uh, insights. 
So let me introduce Michael and John. Um, I'm going to start with our West Coast Renaissance man, Michael Coe, who is a veteran of the derivative space, who's not only a regular uh, on-air business news contributor at CNBC, but an author as well. Mike, welcome and kind of tell our listeners your primary business role now. All right, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, so obviously I've been in the options industry for a number of years now, dating back to the mid-1990s. And I'm always interested in the impact of technology and new approaches and techniques to the options space. Uh, a number of years ago, I was introduced to a team of AI specialists um, by the CBO, uh, formerly known as the Chicago Board Options Exchange. Uh, what we've been focusing on is using artificial intelligence for the structuring systematically of options strategies for investment purposes. So that could be either to overlay institutional investors' existing portfolios and enhance their risk-adjusted returns using options, or to come up with uh, standalone investment strategies uh, that artificial intelligence can uh, basically make accessible to everyday investors. And I know, Michael, you are a coast-to-coast -coast traveler quite often. For those that uh, keep track of Michael's uh, time on CNBC, it's, uh, it's East Coast, West Coast. And uh, I know you're doing a lot of traveling, uh, much along the lines of professional athletes. And, um, you know, next up, someone that also uh, does a lot of traveling. But uh, I think a lot of our listeners would, you know, sort of intimately know. Uh, but one thing I'll, I'll share, because it's, it's kind of an interesting um, tie-in with the NFL, um, John, Dr. J. Nigerian was a linebacker for the Chicago Bears before he sort of turned into this other kind of contact sport, which is trading on the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. And, you know, John, I'm welcoming you back from Europe. And, and it's, it's, I, well, I guess I'm asking you to describe to our listeners your background with the books, the speaking engagements, the CNBC ap appearances. And it's, it's actually a surprise that folks, wouldn't recognize you, but I guess for the 1%, John, that don't, please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, love to, Eric, and thank you for that. Um, pleasure to be on with you. Um, let's see, I, yeah, I did have a cup of coffee, as most people refer to it in the NFL, meaning that I didn't really even play a full season. I played four games um, for the Chicago Bears. Uh, that was a lot of fun, and the best part was it brought me to Chicago, a city that I still live in and love, and uh, obviously was the home to several of the world's biggest exchanges, uh, the CME, the CBOE, the CBOT, uh, even the Chicago Stock Exchange. I mean, they we had at one time probably 7,000 uh, traders in the city of Chicago, not counting off-floor, I mean, floor-based traders, and it was very fun and uh, energetic time to be in the markets, and I'm certainly glad I was a part of it. Uh, it, I think, like Michael, helped me uh, learn uh, the ropes much faster by being thrown into that kind of environment where people are trading so actively rather than investing, um, where obviously investors need to know just as much as traders but you don't need to know it as quickly because you're generally holding positions for a longer period of time. Um, and I've been doing that now for 37 years. Uh, I still love it. We manage money. Uh, we have Investitute. My brother Pete and I have a company called Investitute where we teach people how to trade, and we uh, have subscription services and things like that. And knock on wood, along with Michael Coe, we uh, – all talk about trading and unusual activity on CNBC on a daily basis. Well, you know, look, as I mentioned earlier, you both have been great to me in terms of providing your insight, whether it's at live programs at the exchanges, you know, whether it's uh, on digital formats like this. So, you know, the, the theme of this being, you know, sort of volatility and, you know, how advisors can, you know, sort of interpret market volatility, that there are market opportunities for them to take advantage of. So, 
You, know, you mentioned Chicago, John. I'll start with you. I mean, there's a gentleman there that uh, I think manages uh, a little bit of money by the name of Ken Griffin. And, um, you know, I was looking up and I saw that he, you know, mentioned a, a quote, you know, like a decade plus ago where he said, you know, risk is what you make of it. And, uh, you know, when I look at, you know, risk in the dictionary under, you know, Webster's, they, uh, their definition is it's sort of the tendency to change quickly and unpredictably. So, you know, asking you first, John, you know, where we're, we're seeing risk rear its ugly head again, you know, sort of in February last year, last quarter of 2018. And now here we are early 2019 and sort of things are definitely, uh, you know, showing, you know, some signs that it's going to be a challenging year. You know, you were in Davos uh, a few weeks ago, you know, maybe some insights for our listeners about um, what what is on the minds of investors, uh, big managers and such as it, as it relates to, you know, risk and volatility. Sure. Well, um, obviously, uh, uh, for the most part, risk tends to scare ninety nine percent of investors. Um, it does just the opposite for traders. It's like, uh, you know, uh, throwing a bunch of chum in the water for traders. Traders love volatility. Now, if I'm on the wrong side, I'm not, not to say that Mike and I are always on the right side of volatility, but I think we both understand that uh, volatility is something kind of like fire. You know, you can cook with it or you can get burned by it. And so for the most part, uh, if you're smart and you've had good mentors, you don't try to uh, uh, take advantage of volatility in an amateurish way. Some people would say, oh, volatility's high. We should be in here selling volatility, when in fact volatility usually makes a spike, kind of eases and then makes a second spike, um, as people have done just that, as they've jumped in and um, – perhaps uh, sold it naked, meaning they don't have any hedges on, like you talked about with Ken Griffith. Ken would always want to be able to define risk because, you know, he manages billions, tens of billions of dollars of investor and uh, um, uh, endowment and uh, corporate money. And when you're in that position, the last thing you ever want to do, of course, is call somebody and tell them you lost money for them. Um, Now, there's no guarantees in investing, but there are some pretty good uh, rules that you want to be careful to avoid uh, being open-ended on your risk. And most traders are not open-ended on their risk, meaning that we always try to truncate it. So even when volatility is high, and maybe I want to get in there and sell it, if I do, I'm going to buy something against it so that uh, if I'm wrong and my timing is off a bit, I don't incur a big loss for me or the investors that are counting on me. See, that's a good point, John, and I'm going to ask Michael this because, you know, as I said, volatility, as we, we know, we sort of had the uh, the financial crisis, you know, back in 2008, and then here, you know, here we are in 2019. But 2018 was an interesting year, Mike. You know, we had, you know, the February 5th issues that sort of uh, brought volatility back in the minds of investors and institutions and, of course, advisors who are listening to this podcast. And, you know, for the Option Clearing Corporation, who, you know, I work for, uh, we, ha- we had a record in 2018. Uh, this is a subliminal shout out for the OCC with, uh, you know, clearing a record 5.2 billion contracts that most of you have done in, in 46 years. But, um, you know, we've had these spikes in volatility. And, you know, John, you really coined it well. And I'll ask you, Mike, you know, volatility can, you know, you could, it's like fire, you can cook with it, or you can get burned by it. So, you know, we've got a lot of things going on, Mike, you know, with obviously, you know, trade issues, Brexit, uh, the Fed, sort of back and forth stuff in Washington. It's no wonder, you know, there's a lot of angst in it. But um, I guess, Mike, your thoughts or insights on, you know, how advisors might be proactive with their clients, in terms of option strategies, but you know, how to treat volatility is like this friend or foe yeah so i think we you know we can really think about about two forms of uh, volatility people who follow the options market the derivatives markets uh, certainly have heard um both of them used before one is one is realized volatility which is really just a measure of how much underlying assets are moving around and the other is implied volatility which is 
can be thought of two ways, I think. Uh, one of them is what the market's expectations are in the near term for volatility, um, and also just the, the risk premium in the derivatives markets. Uh, options are often used as a hedging mechanism, uh, and they're often used as a proxy uh, to get exposure to the markets, either long or short. And I think one of the things that John mentioned uh, early on is, is something that I think is a, an important thing for people to remember. Um, I, I think it's when we start seeing higher volatility, there's far better opportunities. Surprisingly, probably for many, on both uh, the long and the short side, and I'm going to speak to the long side in particular, it's interesting when you take a look at when the best time to systematically sell premium, to sell options, to get engaged in things like buy right strategies, when that's most profitable, is probably not when most investors think that would be true. Um, very often, the best time to be selling premium uh, is actually when uh, premiums for options are relatively low. That is to say, the implied volatility is low. You'll see the largest systematic and gaps that persist for some time in low volatility environments. And that would seem to be counterintuitive. You would imagine uh, that what you want to do is when implied volatility rises, that you want to be short options at that time. And actually, very often what you'll see is that the market's actually moving around more at those times than even the options market is expecting. And it moves around much less than the options market is expecting when volatility is low. And there could be a couple of reasons for that, but maybe the biggest reason is that investors have sort of a mean expectation for how markets will behave. And they price risk premia uh, according to those expectations. So in very low volatility environments, there's this persistent belief that volatility is going to recur. And what often happens is that options premiums can be maybe higher than they should be for fairly extended periods of time in low volatility environments because of that expectation. Everyone's sort of waiting for something to happen. Um, and the opposite is also true, um, you know, that when volatility shoots up, uh, there's an expectation that this too shall pass. And what you end up with is a circumstance where actually the markets are moving around perhaps more violently than the options markets expect. And that, too, can persist, generally for not as long a period. Um, but, you know, what happens is that this snap between these regimes can be fairly sharp, particularly those circumstances where you have, uh, I think, as we did this, you know, over the course of the last couple of years, we've had persistent growth in the S&P accompanied by very low volatility, and that lasted uh, for quite a while. You know, right before that snap that we saw that first week of February 2018 that you were referring to, that was preceded by the absolute lowest uh, volatility that we've seen in modern investment times. And what I, I'm really referring to is since options have been actively actively traded. There was a period maybe in the, in the 60s, and I only know this from having studied the data, not so much from experienced it, um, that you know we saw volatility this low, but it was really quite extraordinary uh, how low volatility had gotten, and so you got that very sharp uh, regime change. But um, I think you know from a from a perspective of somebody who traded fairly actively, we're we're glad to see some volatility come back uh, in the sense that you begin to believe that uh, you know people are taking a look at risk assets, um, you know more from one asset to another rather than just generically throwing risk capital. So in very low volatility environments, what I think you're seeing is just that there's a, a risk on mentality. People are sort of looking at any investment, um, maybe not looking at them very carefully. And uh, I think, you know, when you see volatility rise, people start to examine what they have on their books a little bit more closely. You know, that's a good point, Michael. I mean, you were talking about, you know, sort of if, if volatility is high and, you know, maybe you want to start switching, you know, your strategy. And I'm going to ask John, you know, in terms of, you know, the volatility index right now, which obviously both of you guys are on CNBC, we see this, you know, flashed up there. One of the exchanges I represent, obviously the CBO, um, you know, uh, is, you know, affiliated with, uh, with the VIX index, but you know, what, how would an advisor, 
and I'll, I'll sort of use the analogy, John, you know, read the tea leaves or the coffee grinds as, as, as a figure of speech in terms of, you know, how do you consider that index? There are other volatility uh, indexes out there, um, you know, to sort of um, take a pulse of what's going on in the markets. Um, I think most of us use it historically. And just like Michael said, when you're seeing a, a VIX, a realized volatility that's under eight, which it was for much of 2017, or at least for months at a time, it was you know certainly strongly under 10. Um, and you compare that historically, you're saying that's really low. The market usually moves more than this because the VIX, of course, is um, – uh, a constellation of uh, or a, a series of strikes in the S&P 500 used to be the S&P 100, the OEX, but now it's on the S&P 500. And that does roll, uh, meaning it changes from uh, a given period of time and rolls to the next uh, big period of time. Uh, so if you're looking at January options and you're coming up on a Wednesday in January when the options are about to expire, um, those options, nobody's really looking at them. Most of the uh, uh, impact that they would make on the uh, VIX itself are, uh, have been taken out because the calculation is already being pushed out to February and the February options. Um, and they do that just because as you get so close to the end of an option's life, um, it can be something or nothing, uh, meaning zero delta, if you will, or 100 delta, uh, just by crossing the strike price. And so the volatilities would be wild if they left that in place. So instead, to smooth things out, the VIX moves over um, and they take a blend of the VIX and that blend goes further and further into the next month, the closer you get to the expiration that you're in. Uh, the example I just gave, January to February, for instance. And so how would an advisor or a, um, somebody in a family office or otherwise use that information? Um, like I say, we tend to use it historically, meaning that we're looking at it saying, okay, this seems really high relative to historic norms or really low, or right at average of historic norms. At average, we, we don't care as much. Um, when it's too low, we want to be fairly aggressive buyers against a portfolio of stocks that mirror that index, the S&P 500. Or um, if it's high, um, I would uh, be very careful trying to buy protection when it's high because uh, that's when I could get caught holding the bag and all of a sudden – you see how quickly we've come down now from, you know, volatility readings in the high 30s um, to back down into the 15s. And it can happen very quickly um, if you didn't have the whole damage of December, if it was only a few days worth of damage that spiked the market in volatility, um, you would have seen the volatility come out much quicker. The only reason in my belief that it stayed as high as it did for as long as it did was the December damage was for virtually all the way till the, and through the 24th of December when finally it you know peaked and then we bled off since then and very quickly the volatility came back down to a more normal level because we're not going to see 30s or 32 volatility very often uh, because it implies 2% moves in the market a day. We were getting that in the beginning of December all the way through the 24th, but we weren't getting that uh, from that day forward. And so, John, you know, I, I don't know who I heard this from. It might be your brother. It might have been you. It might have been Michael, or it might have also been uh, someone else there that traded on the floor. I sort of heard this, you know, mantra that you should never nix the VIX, that uh, you can't really disregard it. It's, uh, you know, it, it is a leading fear gauge, but um, I think it, it frightens or it scares advisors. I mean, look, you know, you both have been on panels with me and we've been we've done things at exchanges before where, you know, I, I, I tend to talk more about mitigating and managing risk rather than introducing the word option. But so, you know, Michael, you know, in terms of advisors seeing the the fear index all the time, but um, you know, 
John really kind of spelled it out really well, obviously, from a family office standpoint, too. But, you know, advisors that uh, are paying attention, but also sort of, you know, saying, look, you know, it's at a low level right now. And John said, you know, maybe maybe this is an opportunity to now start to put on positions um, in, an, in an income basis because maybe volatility is really low here. And, you know, this is where we should be having dialogues in terms of that, that income conversation. I, I, your thoughts on that, Mike? Yeah, so, you know, I think one of the critical things to think about is, you know, when you're when you're looking at this, how volatile or, you know, how volatile is the market in actuality? How much are the, the daily swings we're seeing? Um, what are the prices of options? And also the types of trades that you're trying to do. Um, here's, here's one way to think about it, right? So what, what's one of the most common, and I'll call it an investment strategy, because I think it really doesn't correlate that closely to the types of things that, that John and Pete and I used to do on the floor. We were typically delta neutral when we, when we traded options. But what investors, maybe they're the first thing that they will tend to do um, that's an investment strategy is they'll sell calls against stocks that they own. And when you see volatility in, you know, at lower levels, uh, what that will typically tell you is that you probably are not seeing uh, a regime where you've had a recent sharp decline. Um, you know, when the market's sort of grinding higher, realize volatility is low, and options premium might be low. Now, if you own a basket of stocks uh, and you're not expecting to turn those stocks over very often, when you sell calls against it and you suddenly see a spike in volatility, what is likely to have caused that spike in volatility? Well, very likely you've seen a, a move to the downside in equity prices. Right? So if you have seen that, uh, chances are selling calls against your stocks. It may not have helped create a lot of insurance for you to the downside. After all, it's kind of a coupon clipping type of a strategy. Maybe you're collecting uh, 1% of the underlying assets value on a monthly basis. But if you've been doing this fairly consistently, you've been collecting those coupons for a while, when the market does go down, um, that's a circumstance where those calls that you sold are now worthless. You can buy them back. Um, so this is why it matters a lot what your strategy is. Um, when you think about volatility and the premiums you spend, you know, John made a good point. Once the market has dropped and you see a big increase in volatility, you're thinking, you know, should I run out and buy puts? Because very often there's a knee-jerk response, a panicky response, you know, what's bad could quickly become worse. Two things are going on here. Uh, one is that you're going to be paying a much higher price for these options uh, because the volatility has risen, the implied volatility has risen. The other is that you're actually be buying much lower strikes. You know, these are cir circumstances where that strategy might very likely be bad for two reasons. I mean, if you take a look at how just the S&P 500 behaves after you see very sharp increases in the VIX, which is what we were talking about before, it goes to 30 or beyond, it's not too many circumstances where that represents a good time to short the market. And the reason that is, is I kind of think of it a little bit like a relative strength index. What happens is uh, there's a bit of a washout, there's a little bit of panic, and what is probably going to punish you is that not only are you paying up for insurance, but you are buying it after the thing you're trying to insure against has already taken place. It's a little, it's, uh, a little bit uh, horses out of the barn kind of thing, as far as I'm concerned. So if you take a look at institutional investors and for advisors who aren't going to be trading um, intraday, probably not daily, maybe not weekly, you know, the question you might want to ask yourself is, you know, when implied volatility rises sharply after the market has fallen sharply, are there names that we are not in or aren't in as much as we might want to be um, that now we could think about potentially selling puts to find places where we could enter them? Um, you know, this is a strategy that a lot of big institutional investors uh, have used when they have core positions that they like, maybe they haven't really liked the valuation, now it's starting to become more attractive, and they say, well, you know, if I could own it 10% lower, and now I'm getting 3 4% uh, 
of the current stock price essentially to sell some premium below it and potentially have the stock put to me at those levels. That's you know that's the kind of strategy uh, that one might consider. And it's you know this is nothing new. Uh, I think it's kind of a natural thing for options traders to be naturally contrarian, or at least that's been my professional experience. And I think that that makes sense uh, in this context as well. The thing that you don't want to do um, is, in my view anyway, is to you know try to sell a lot of put premium, for example, when implied volatility is low because the market seems so stable, because that is a way to, to collect small amounts of money um, and and you know over a long period of time and then to lose it very very quickly. And I. I realize that a lot of people will say selling covered calls is uh, synthetically equivalent to selling puts, but for investors, that isn't necessarily true. Uh, investors have an allocation. They might be allocated to equities. They might be willing to sell out of some of those equities at higher prices. But uh, generally, you know, you're not looking to get materially longer um, you know, when risk premia are very, very low. But you might be looking at getting materially longer when risk premia are very, very high. You know, and Mike, the the point of sort of looking at different option strategies. I mean, there's so many different series out there, and you know, you look at option montages, and and can be kind of overwhelming. Um, you know, I, I think you and John uh, touched on this, and I I'll I'll bring John in afterwards on this. But um, is there does it make a difference when you're selecting an option strategy to sort of do some pre work? I mean, like you know, kind of sort of. Take a step back. I mean, I'm I'm using the football analogy here as well. You know, to have a game plan in mind. You know, um, obviously, John touched on it now. Volatility, you know, exorbitantly high in December before the holidays, and kind of carried into January. And here we are at low volatility or median volatility right now. Um, so you know, I'm sort of rhetorically asking you this, but you know, about doing some pre work before you know before delving into a strategy. Yeah, no, I, I think that's definitely true, especially when you start thinking about entry and exit levels for individual equities. Uh, I think that's true. I think, you know, the volatility we saw in December and that we also saw in, in early February of last year, uh, you know, those were circumstances where it wasn't really so much an idiosyncratic stock-specific type of an issue. We were really dealing with more sort of macro concerns and considerations, Um you know, so I, you know, I'd probably try to make a differentiation between those two. Um, you know, we also have seen, you know, very temporary sort of glitchy uh, spikes in volatility that uh, might have a mild macro driver. I think last February was was probably an example of that. Um, you know, where we had, uh, you know, a lot of very short volatility uh, players and the structure of their of their strategies was vulnerable, you know, so it, it was a situation where they could uh, see fairly stable returns, but it was fragile, and that fragility sort of fed on itself and in, in a kind of autoregressive fashion, meaning that the more volatile things became, uh, the more aggressive their hedging strategies had to become, and that actually exacerbated the whole thing. Um, but, you know, from, a, from an investor's point of view, you, you want to try to take advantage of those circumstances and say, okay, is, is this something that is really presenting a, a macro risk, or is this something that is kind of isolated? And in that particular case, I think, you know, it was isolated. You just had to wait for it to wash out, and it presented investors with an interesting opportunity. You know, even in December, too, we had a circumstance where, you know, the VIX shot up, went north of 30. Uh, it was, you know, accompanied by a fairly sharp decline in, in equity prices. Um, that maybe the fundamentals didn't necessarily justify that kind of a, a drawdown. I think just taking a look at the earnings that we've seen so far this earnings season, um, I don't know that they're blowing the doors off, but uh, we have mostly beats on the top line, mostly beats on the bottom line. Um, and, you know, you just sort of have to listen to the conference calls and, and see what people are telling us about what, uh, what the forecast looks like. So I'll, I'll put John on the spot then, and I guess, you know, going back to analogies of coffee and options and, you know, we kind of are familiar with how to make that, that perfect cup of joe. You know, there's, there's all those variables that come into play. I guess it's, you know, sort of your, you know, how coarse of the grind, the, the, how, how is, hot is the temperature and, the, you know, you extract this, you know, your water ratio to coffee and such. So it's really not dissimilar to, 
you know, doing a, an overlay strategy, John. And, you know, I guess it's, you know, are you bullish or bearish? You know, where are you determining your strikes and your expiration? And, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, potentially, you know, are you are you closer in? Are you are you, you know, uh, are you out of the money are you rolling and such? So um, I guess I'm I, I'm asking you, John, you know, you, you, you've been doing this for decades and it's uh, you know, on the surface. It seems complicated. Um, much like how you get beans to grind and make a cup of coffee. So, you know, in terms of options, there, you know, you've been saying this for a long time. It's not really that complicated. You just kind of have to this this idea of pre-work and have a sense of where your strategy is and maybe sticking to it. Yeah, true. And um, uh, I think the uh, the worst thing you can do is get caught in a uh, a low volume or liquidity situation. So those wouldn't make most of uh, – Mike's scans or my scans, or uh, if, if God forbid, those are in some of the uh, uh, investors' portfolios that are listening, um, that's one of the worst situations you can be in, is to be in a low uh, liquidity situation. In other words, you either can't buy back the options or the stock isn't liquid enough either, and they usually go hand in hand. Um, but outside of that, what we're trying to do more often than not, Eric, is um, especially for institutions that we trade for, is that we're trying to uh, do a, a bunch of strips rather than just picking one expiration and uh, selling the options that we like uh, to collect the premium that we want for the cash flow and so forth, provide a little bit of downside uh, protection, you know, but that's obviously pretty thin gruel if the market makes a December-like correction. If you're not spending money on protection, whether it's VIX call spreads or whether it's uh, S&P put spreads or whatever um, against your positions, um, then those uh, little bit of premiums you collect usually, you know, obviously in the 1% to 2% range um, aren't providing that much downside on a 10% correction. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to sell strips um, in especially the bigger, more liquid stocks. So, for instance, in Facebook, we would be buying back our options that would be expiring this week and selling another strip out five weeks out so that we've always got basically three or four strips on at a time um, where we've got them further and further out in time. Um, and usually that's about as far out as we're going is five weeks. Um, so... We've always got something in the front because that's expiring so fast that it's like air escaping a balloon. You can hear it. Uh, the premium's coming out on a daily basis. Traders kind of make fun of it sometimes by making a hissing sound like a snake because that's what the premium sounds like as it's just eroding away in those final days of the option's life. But we never really ride them to zero. We're buying those back as they get to this final week and then pushing them out five weeks further where I can get something with some meat on it because would I rather have an option that's down to 11 cents or 15 cents and not buy it back uh, or would I rather buy it back and keeping in mind that I have a set number of contracts that I want to be short, be short some contracts that are five weeks out where I'm collecting a buck 20 instead of you know that 12 cents that I've got left to make if these options don't get called uh, and turn into stock this week. I'm only getting 11 cents worth of protection or 15 cents worth of protection, so why not buy them back and roll that out to the further strip that I need to keep the uh, returns coming and yet have a little justification for um, if the market does spike up on good earnings or anything else that uh, I don't just get called out for something that was only 11 cents and I feel like a putz for uh, being short those things. So I, you know, I like that theme of flexibility, John. And you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of put you, you both on the spot in a way because you know here we are, you know, talking a central theme about volatility, and uh, it's maybe softened a little bit. But you know, Michael, what do you see? And uh, you know, I know they do this to you a lot on the show, so I'm not going to be Melissa Lee. I couldn't anywhere near. Uh, you know, handle the capabilities that she does of uh, corralling all you, you know, you option guys 
when she's on TV and going back and forth between, uh, you know, all, all of the, uh, the, the, dif the differing opinions. But, um, you know, I'll start with you, Mike, and, and, and maybe ask you, you know, where do you see volatility this year? I mean, uh, uh, did, did you anticipate us to be, you know, here we are this low uh, or kind of a median low? And, and um, do you foresee us uh, uh, having some real big gyrations this year? Uh, you know, we seem to live in a news cycle where we're kind of lurching around um, with a, a couple potentially big uh, macro drivers for volatility is what I'm really referring to here. Um, so could I see volatility go higher? Uh, I could. You know, I've heard some people say that they think that it's going to go much higher and that it's going to stay much higher. And you know, I don't uh, necessarily agree with that. You know, we, we, have, we have lived in a relatively low volatility environment essentially since, you know, the, the real end to uh, the credit crisis. Um, but actually, even if you take a look at volatility before all of that, you know, occurred, you know, we're still looking at, at realized volatility um, well below uh, 18% probably for the S&P on average. Uh, and that includes, you know, a lot of sort of idiosyncratic events. I mean, if we go back, uh, you know, John's been at this now for, I think he said at the beginning of this call, about 35 years, I go uh, back to, um, you know, the 90s. So maybe, you know, it's uh, not quite 30, um, 30 years for me yet, but we'll we're getting pretty close now. And we always are going to have these sort of isolated cases where volatility uh, shoots up. You know, we had several in the 1990s. We have some that are bigger. My biggest concern in terms of what could increase volatility is just that, you know, we have seen some levering up of corporate balance sheets. And, you know, we know a couple of things, and that is that very often equity market volatility is preceded by some weakening in the credit markets. And the more levered a balance sheet is, uh, just functionally, even if things aren't going wrong fundamentally with the business, the more volatile equity becomes. Makes sense. Um, you know, the value of the enterprise uh, could go up and down by 10%, but if the balance sheet is 50% levered, then the value of the equity is moving around by 20%. And so obviously we should expect to see a little bit more equity market volatility simply as a function of the fact that businesses are slightly more levered. Um, you know, aside from that, though, you know, the things that I think would really create problems would be, um, you know, if we started to see, for example, some, some sharp spikes in inflation. And the reason that could introduce – Volatility, as far as I'm concerned, is because uh, suddenly that's going to create a bit of a rate spike uh, to the degree that that debt has to roll over. It can create a little bit of uh, credit cycle wobbliness, and I think that that would push through to equities. Um, I'm kind of hopeful that we're not going to see a different form of volatility introduced from sort of political events, and I, you know, with all of the teeth gnashing that that we might get from time to time, uh, I don't think we're likely to see that this year. So, John, I don't know if I could have asked you beforehand whether you thought that the Rams would have scored more points or that Brady would be walking around today with six rings on his fingers. Uh, I think you have a better understanding and maybe interpretation of 37 years being in this business to maybe give some insights on volatility versus uh, how the Super Bowl <laughs> would have played out yesterday. So I'll ask you your opinion on the vo the volatility scenario and what we might see in advisors paying attention for the rest of the year. Well, um, I agreed with Mike uh, and his comments about, um, you know, the, the biggest things I think that, that are likely to spike volatility are either – um, political, uh, global uh, trade issues, or um, perhaps uh, the Fed, if it got overzealous, like I think they were a little bit overzealous, um, or at least they expressed a more uh, hawkish uh, outlook 
when uh, October 3rd, when Chairman Powell uh, expressed what he expressed and said, you know, that um, we could see substantially higher rates, more or less, um, and that we were nowhere near neutral. Um, I, I think any of those kinds of things, and those are almost impossible to predict, even though we know um, when Fed uh, speakers are going to be speaking, we never really know um, if they're going to go off uh, and speak off the cuff like he did at that time. Um, back in the old days, of course, I think some of the old timers will remember that, uh, uh, you know, you just had to look at the thickness of Alan Greenspan's uh, briefcase or uh, basically try to figure out which one of the words that they rearranged in a sentence, what that might mean, because they didn't speak off the cuff. Um, now they speak uh, virtually every meeting, and that's a bit of a risk. So if I were a betting man, which I am, I would watch those times, you know, when Fed speakers are going to be speaking, in particular the Fed chairman is going to be speaking. As far as the, those political risks I mentioned, um, you know, we don't know if the president would ever be indicted. We don't know if uh, we will come to a trade deal this year. Um, but generally, we get pretty good intel leading into both events from people around them. Um, so I think that we'll see relatively modest but not low uh, volatility this year. I think right about where we are, 15 to 17, is about historically where the market should be. Um, I know we've, I think it's more like 18 has been the historic norm, but, um, you know, for us to be much higher than that requires um, consistent uh, movement of the market uh, beyond that 1% sort of uh, up and down range. And I don't really see that absent, you know, one of the uh, catalysts that I just kind of detailed. So I'd say overall, the, the vol should be about where we're at, 15 to 17, and we will see some spikes and we will likely see some slumps as well um, into the out of the teens, but probably not into the single digits anymore. So I'm going to probably have to bring you both back at the end of the year to hold you to that, but we'll we'll see okay. what happens. And yeah, I mean, I'm I'm, you know, I'm thinking along the same lines of uh, a lot of the you know thoughts that the two of you uh, presented in terms of where the markets might go, and you know, obviously, you know, strategies that that advisors could be looking at, you know, in terms of if the market is in a low vol scenario, which we kind of are right now, or we rewind a couple of months ago where things were, you know, in some severe vol um, headwinds and, you know, advisors, you know, again, want to be a little bit more proactive, you know, rather than, uh, you know, waiting for, uh, you know, things to be coming at them at full speed, you know. So one of the things that I going to incorporate uh, in future podcasts, and I'll start off, uh, you know, with both of you on this is, is that um, what, I, what I'd like to ask, and I'll start with you, John, is, uh, is maybe, maybe a, a fun fact about you that maybe some of the viewers don't know. But, uh, you know, if, if, you were, if you weren't trading or you weren't, uh, you know, involved in the derivative markets, um, what do you think you might be doing? Mm, I'd probably try to be either a screenwriter or an artist. Um, I, I love to write, um, do it a lot, and uh, um, have uh, worked on a couple of uh, uh, plots for uh, shows, some of which have uh, been episodes of uh, people's shows on television. Uh, those have been fun to contribute to. Um, but I also like, uh, like I say, uh, the art side of things. So if I weren't doing what I was doing, I suspect I would either be um, drawing, painting, or writing. Well, you know what? There's still a lot of time left for that. You're a young guy, and uh, we're, <laughs> yes, and we're and we're hoping that exhibit is going to be uh, sometime soon. That would be actually very cool. And uh, you know, it's uh, something to look forward for. And uh, and Michael, I'll, I'll ask you. You know, if you, you know, uh, three some odd decades ago, if if things were different. Uh, and, and you weren't uh, as a trader or in the capital markets and such. What, what about yourself? Yeah, so, you know, when I, was in, when I was in college, I actually put my first options trade on when I was in college. But one of the other things I did was I, I started a, a business 
at the time, um, I remembered that you know it was really hard to find housing uh, for for college kids off campus, and we had a housing office, and you would go in there. I'm obviously dating myself somewhat, but you'd go in, and they would literally have these three ring binders with um, you know numbers and addresses describing uh, what you could you know what you could find off campus. And I remember thinking to myself, this, this is just ridiculous. There has to be a better way to do this. Uh, I ended up starting a, a business when I was in college called the Apartment Connection. My brother actually was doing some of the coding. Um, and we had a, a voice-activated response system. So you could actually call up. This is before the Internet, really. I mean, the only thing you could You are find. dating yourself. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> this goes back. I'm 50 years old, right? So, um you could call up and you could say into the phone, you know, you wanted a two-bedroom and how much you could spend and things like that. I, I'm a big believer uh, that, you know, technology changes the world. Uh, you know, I started a bit of a technology company back then. And I suppose working with artificial intelligence now, although it is in the option space, um, in a way I'm still kind of doing that. It doesn't have to be about options necessarily, Um you know, I would. I hope I would be doing something in the technology space, and we have some great entrepreneurs doing that right now. You know, I'm not. I'm not making any prognostications on how Tesla is going to uh, fare in the long run, whether it'll be a huge success or whether the naysayers will be right. But one thing is definitely true, and that is, it's changing the world. Ten years ago, somebody had said, you know, we're going to have electric cars. We'll all be driving them. They're going to be better than any cars you've ever had before. I think people probably would have wondered how glorified golf cart could actually be so impressive. And yet here we are. And, uh, you know, I think we all take it for granted that we're all going to be driving electric cars someday and maybe someday soon uh, and that they will indeed be much better. And so technology, absolutely. I would be looking to do almost anything in that space. And if they wouldn't have me at a high level, I'd still be – Happy to work in that industry at a low one, I think. Well, we want to see more of that to come, Michael. And it's, you know, it's interesting, you know, when I mentioned early in this podcast about celebrating a decade this month uh, in the option space, I feel very fortunate not only to get to work with uh, gentlemen like the two of you, but all the advisors that are out there listening and the firms and just the opportunity to be able to represent the exchanges and the OCC in an industry that still is fairly young and that uh, we're, uh, we're still trying to make some inroads. Uh, you know, you talked about electric cars. I mean, I think the three of us uh, recently heard that uh, bringing this back to this brewrific theme of coffee and such that, uh, you know, the founder of uh, Starbucks is, uh, you know, interestingly, maybe throwing his name in the hat to be in the White House. So who would have thunk that, you know, uh, 30 or, uh, or 40 years ago that uh, potentially the person that's in the White House is someone that uh, got everybody in this country – to spend uh, a lot of money on a cup of Java, and uh, and we're consistently doing that even today. So um, I'm going to bring this all full circle for our uh, our listeners here. Uh, one of the things I want to mention that any of the strategies or topics or such that we've talked about, please, please go to our website, www.optionseducation.org. You can find the advisor page there. I also earlier in the podcast talked about the 888 options. That is our phone number, our investor services. That is there five days a week. And not only will they be able to share some more information about upcoming podcasts, we also encourage you all, our listeners, to please provide suggestions or maybe some future topics you'd like to hear about. And we'll all leave you with this, I guess, taking the term coffee. We want you all to consider using option strategies for your clients. Find various educational resources easily at optionseducation.org. So thank you all for listening. We look forward to having you all next time. And Michael, John, can't thank you enough. Thanks again for being on.
The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 